preparing and we are streaming. Hello, 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 world schoolers. Hey, everybody. I hope you get, I gave you enough time uh, letting you know that we were coming to you live. I wanted to um, interview people from our community, especially that have talents and skills that I don't have. And for sure, one of them that I am so not good at is planning, preparations, and um, packing. So those are the things that I reached out to you, the community, to see who really loves this stuff and can talk to our our community and share their expertise. And I'm so thrilled to be connected with Saren. Um, Saren, welcome, welcome. You're coming to us from Atlanta, Georgia, and I am coming to you from Mexico, the heart of Mexico. So welcome, tell us a little bit about you. your background. Yes, thank you, it's so nice to be here. I'm very excited to talk with you. Um, my background, Atlanta is our home base. Um, I've been a pediatric speech pathologist for 15 years. I have two kids and a lovely husband. My kids are nine and almost 11. And we are making a big transition right now. We've been traveling on and off for, since my daughter was four months old and well before that. Um, and we've had a traditional life and work job, you know, jobs and, and work life here in Atlanta, but we would travel for long periods of time in between with the kids. And we are transitioning to long-term full-time traveling with our kids. We've been homeschooling, unschooling, um, and taking that big leap into traveling. That is so wonderful. Um, and I love that. So is is the excitement building? We are very excited. My kids are finishing out a couple of their commitments this semester, which is why we're here in our home base. And for them, it's very exciting. I think my husband, who has always had a traditional, you know, nine to five or longer job and kind of had to travel in between with us, is nervous. Um, and I am the main planner in the family, which is my, you know, my obsessive research and planning is probably what got me here with you. Um, and I'm very excited, but a little bit overwhelmed, to be honest. But I'm trying to take everything that we've learned from traveling and planning over the last decade and put that together to make it stress free by the time that we take off. That's perfect. And I am like you in the sense where I research everything, but I, you know, part of me is detail oriented, but I'm really a big conceptual thinker and I tend to just sort of like trust the experience. I get as much information as possible and then I go with it, feeling as prepared as I can and I feel confident that I make decisions on the fly. But I know a lot of people who are just starting out need to have more than that. And I yeah. am not good with those sorts of details. So what's the first thing that you you have been doing in your own family's preparation? That's a great question. So the first thing that we or I started doing was first sitting down and having a very long and detailed conversation with my husband or your spouse, your travel partner, whoever you're traveling with, if you're with another adult, um, and being on the same page, you know, talking about your monthly budget, what kind of accommodations everybody is going to be comfortable in, if you're willing to be uncomfortable in certain situations, um, pref travel preferences. Some people are really excited to kind of wing it. Some people want a very specific plan. Um, yeah. destinations that, right. I'm, I'm trying to wing it more. I'm trying to plan, 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 and then allow myself to wing it, which is really hard for a planner, a type A planner. Um, but it's one of my kind of goals for myself now that we're going to full-time traveling is to be more of a, let's just see what happens kind of person. Um, but I'll see what, I'll see what happens if that actually happens for me. Uh, but being on the same page with your travel partner, places you want to visit, places that you really don't want to visit. There are some places where, you know, my husband said, I really don't feel like I need to go there. Um, and how long you're going to travel, whether you're going to slow travel or fast travel, which makes yeah. a huge difference in the way you're traveling feels. So I think getting on the same page with the other, if you have another adult who's traveling with you and making those decisions is step number one, for sure. Um, I would even advocate getting the kids on board too, because this is their number two as well. <laughs> Yes. So that's step, that's my step number two. We had we had a lot of adult conversations first so that we were on the same page. 
And then we brought it to the kids. And of course they were so excited and they started listing out all the places they wanted to go and things they wanted to do. And what I did after a few weeks and months of kind of revisiting this conversation with the kids and, and, and us as a family was I actually made my own kind of worksheet guide. I, I have it on our website, on our World Adventures travel blog now for the public to use, but it's a guide of how to talk to your kids about preparing to travel full time, what to say, how to say it, worksheets they can fill out about how they're feeling and places they want to go, things they want to do, people they're going to miss from home, and how to make those goodbyes go as smooth as possible so everybody feels heard and validated and everybody feels like their perspectives and preferences are taken into account. Super important. And when we're done with this conversation, I'm going to invite you to put that link into the thread so people can access that. So I work in mental health and what you're talking about is super important. And I I generally call that like setting the stage. So you're Mm -hmm. creating a culture where you're starting to normalize talking about these things before you leave. Can you go a little deeper into these topics and maybe share an example? Okay. (laughs) Absolutely. I'd love to. So I agree with you. It has to be a culture in your family about talking about how everyone's feeling and what, how everyone's doing and what their preferences are. If you don't have that initial culture of conversation, I would start that well before you leave for traveling. Um, And part of this kind of veers into the unschooling lifestyle as well, because a lot of unschoolers and families who unschool and world school, they tend to keep, take into account their kids' needs and feelings very explicitly. And I love that. Um, I have a really specific, you know, guide of how to talk about this on our website, but some ideas of how to just change your communication style with your kids when talking about this huge life transition, um, instead of saying things like, don't be worried, or don't be sad, or, you know, don't worry, you're going to get to do all these great things, which isn't really validating their feelings about it. Um, I like to say things more like, I can see you're feeling a little worried. I feel worried about these things as well and here's sometimes what I do and tell me more about it let's talk about how you're feeling um because this is scary this is a huge leap into leaving their life behind leaving family and friends and their their bed and their own things and their rooms and it can be really hard for kids who don't have life experience like adults do to make that transition and to even picture it in their mind um so we have a lot of hard Sorry to interrupt you. It can be hard, but it also can be quite simple, too. And I think a lot of world schoolers get into their their head that kids need security, need this, need that. And and we Mm -hmm. chalk it up to meaning like security in a lot of people's heads mean a brick and mortar house when actually what it means is security of the family unit and you could take that with you. And some kids do struggle, but guess what? Some kids thrive. So, you know, like sort of being open, you know? (laughs) So I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make sure that there are some kids that, you know, everybody, let's recognize those that just thrive and, and really step into their own flexibility and resilience and, and I agree. Yeah. Yeah. This is an opportunity for them and for the adults in the family to learn to be flexible and to learn to have different experiences. And I think preparation is just the key to being flexible. And like you said, when we first started talking about this, and we actually sold our bricks and mortar house a few months ago in anticipation of all of this. So we're really, you know, committed to it. And the kids were a little bit worried. And I said to them, no matter where we go, you're still with us. We're yeah. still together as a family. And something that we really like to do is to keep our nightly or special family routines in place, because this is not a vacation. This is your life just in different locations. So the stability, at least for our family, comes from routine. You know, we still read together at night before bed. We have family games that we play. We have, you know, religious holidays that we celebrate no matter where we are. So the, as you said, the feeling of connectedness is still there no matter what bricks and mortar place you are in Um, and we've been talking a lot about that is we're we're together as a family no matter what yeah and i and i learned this by being on the road with my son and he was constantly asked don't you need security and he would say with 
pure, pure joy and commitment and authenticity. I got security. I got my mom, mm -hmm. you know, right. and I was like, yeah, okay, okay, we got this. <laughs> so, exactly, absolutely. So, and in fact, that actually, I know this isn't something that you, because I've got a wonderful prepared, prepared bullet point yeah. list from you because <laughs> you're a preparer. Um, but this isn't on the the bullet list, but I was going to ask you, because it's an experience I had, how do you, through your preparations, deal with the naysayers in your life that might be close to you, family, that might be f close friends, that are not supporting this um, decision? That's a great question. I think it's going to vary depending on who you're speaking to and how much you want to get into it. Um, We've been homeschooling and unschooling for years now. And I think in the beginning, there were more naysayers because that was a big change for our family. And nobody else in our family lives like this. Everybody's here in Atlanta. <laughs> Everyone goes to, to traditional right. school except for us. You know, the great thing is that we're very, yeah, but we're very close with the grandparents in our family and they've been really supportive. And I think you just have to respectfully let people know that you're happy to have a conversation if they're interested, but this is a decision that you're making for your family and it's what's best for your family. And you appreciate their concern, but aren't really interested in getting into a argument about it. Um, I don't feel the need to, you know, to explain to other people why we're doing things, but if they're really interested and curious, and I love to have those conversations, but I think it's okay to just say, this is our choice. It's what's best for our family. We appreciate your concern. Um, but we're not ready to, you know, have an argument over it. Yeah, and it's I think really uh, standing standing true to your own truth as a family unit, and clearly discussing what boundaries you will discuss, which which boundaries you won't cross over with other people is is wonderful, and it's important yeah. that all the people in your family understand this as well. Yeah, and I re I recall an experience um, years, years, years ago. We were in Colombia, and my son, who must have been twelve at the time, uh, was totally berated by by a, ch a kid his age who just had pure judgment over not going to school and traveling and and this lifestyle and and you know what? How will you ever be anything? And and because mm -hmm. we were a couple years into our travels, it still affected him because he you know who know, who likes to be criticized, but to actually know what works and and to know that we are living our values versus you know just sort of going through life without any you know sense of why we're doing what we're doing it it helped him sort of address and stand his ground but it's kind of hurtful when people say mean yeah things. it is and i think that's important to prepare your kids we've talked a lot for many years and in many situations we talk with the kids about you know what it means in our family to be educated and what it means to yeah. be a, lear a learner learning from the world and a lot of times the kind of one line phrase I give my kids, if someone's getting in my kid's face about it is everybody's different. We do what's good for us and that's okay. And then we just kind of walk away from the situation. So it's one thing if someone's asking me questions, but if they're getting in my, with my kids about it, who are young and don't really know how to always respond, they can kind of fall back on everyone's different. That's okay. And then just sort of leave the situation. So I think it's helpful to give younger kids sort of a one line phrase that they can practice with you and they can remember. Um, and we use that phrase for so many things. I mean, when we see people out in the world who are different to us, which is all the time, it's, yeah, you notice that was different, but everyone's different, that's okay. Or, you know, my daughter just recently wanted to do something pretty drastic to her hair and she was out in the world and seeing different things and she would say, oh, look at that. And I'd say, yeah, that's cool. Everyone's different, that's okay. And that's an easy line that they can remember to use in so many situations um, that kind of diffuses the tension if other kids are asking them questions. Yeah, awesome. I'm going to ask you another question, but I do want to say hello to Lena and Anita and Sarah and Talia. And there's some other people watching that I don't have your names. So if you guys have questions about planning and preparations, please put them in the chat and I'll be sure to ask. 
um, our fabulous guest, Saren. Um, so, but my next question to you is, what are some of those mistakes that you think novice uh, world schoolers or those that are, you know, first time preparing for their trips make? And what would yeah. you say to them to help them not make those mistakes? Great question. Learn from my mistakes. <laughs> so I have a I have a very detailed post about this on our World Adventures Travel blog. But here's some of my top things that I think novice travelers need to remember. And also, um, if you're planning a family gap year or the beginning of your full time travels, just things to keep in mind. Um, no, mistake number one is the security of your technology that you're bringing with you. Um, if you're not using a VPN, which is a virtual private network and you don't know about e-SIM cards yet, those are two things that have saved my butt so many times. Um, you don't wanna be on your computer using Wi-Fi, looking at your banking information, at your credit cards, at any other, logging into any websites without using a VPN. So these are simple software that you can download on your computer. Um, I have a very detailed article about it, but don't get scared off. I'm not a tech person, I am the least techy person, but you simply, it's about 10 bucks or so a month. You download a VPN to all your devices and then you're just protected. It protects your login, your IP address information, your anything that you would do. It's not accessible to people outside of your IP network. Um, so I would definitely recommend downloading that before you leave. And that's really good also for travel tricks. If you're searching for flights or accommodations and you don't want to search as an outsider to the country, you want to get those inside prices. You can search, you know, let's say you're a U.S. Uh, family and you're in Australia, you can change your VPN to an Australian IP address and get better prices within the country for things like flights and accommodations. So you can do that really easily. And an eSIM card is something like you used to put SIM cards into our phones. Now you can just have one on your phone as an app. And it is good for hundreds of different countries and gives you data and um, minutes and phone calls and, you know, all the Wi-Fi connectedness you would need without those prices as if you were be outside the country, so without roaming. So those are two technology uh, recommendations I have. Um, I always, I'm kind of old school like this. I always make paper photocopies of my important documents. I leave copies of passports, driver's licenses, my kid's birth certificate, um, marriage certificates. So sometimes if you're traveling without your spouse or your partner, and you want to go somewhere alone with your kids, some airlines will require a lot of information from you. I make copies of those. I leave them at home with a trusted person in our home base. I put one in every single backpack and travel back that we have. So all of our documents are copied in every backpack because if one gets lost and you only have copies of some of the other backpacks. Um, and of course, we save them on the cloud and securely online as well. But copies of lots of your important documents, put them in every bag. Um, this Super smart. That. Yeah. Good and that, thank you to my mom who taught me that at the age of like 14 when I went abroad for the first time and she put copies of documents in every bag, but you need it. Um, <laughs> wasting money on foreign transaction fees, but especially on foreign ATM fees. Um, most credit cards these days don't charge foreign, tra foreign transaction fees, but you also need to get a checking account with a debit card where you can pull out some cash. Sometimes you need cash when you're in more rural or you know, not large cities, and you will get hit with big ATM fees. So you want a checking account and you can look online for the most up-to-date one because we've used a few over the years, but you want one that reimburses you on both sides, both on your side and on the foreign side for those ATM fees, because you can save, you could waste hundreds of dollars pulling totally. cash out when you need it. So that's important. Um, and you're going to like this one, Lainey. One of the biggest travelers uh, mistakes that travelers make is sticking too closely to your prepared itinerary. <laughs> right? yeah. so prepare 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 but then once you've kind of found yourself settled in a, in a you know hotel or apartment or airbnb or a house sit which we can talk about too um where you're comfortable there's things you might want to do but be open and flexible to trying some new things and maybe going off of your prepared itinerary that's well, where the magic happens yeah totally totally i totally agree <laughs> But, and since you mentioned house sits and Airbnbs, and I don't even know if you are aware or do couch surfing or things like that, mm -hmm. but can you go ahead and talk about accommodations and planning and yeah. preparation along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. So 
I kind of look on all of the different websites before I decide how we're going to stay in a place. And that'll also depend on whether we're there for a week, a month, three months. It just depends on what length of time you're there for. We don't do a lot of like hotel resort style places for a few reasons. Um, that's more of a vacation kind of thing in my mind where you're not really getting to know the community and the culture and the, and the city or country that you're in. And it can be really expensive unless you're saving up some points, hotel points or credit card points for a resort style vacation. So once in a while, we'll spend a few days lounging by a nice pool, but it's pretty rare. Um, I look at apartments, furnished apartments. I look at Airbnbs and sometimes if you call or contact the Airbnb owner, outside of Airbnb, they'll give you a very big discount for staying, you know, three to four weeks or more. So that's always something to look into. Um, I like, in, if you're in Asia or that part of the world, I like looking on agoda.com. Yeah, I like agoda too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really like it as well. You know, booking.com is great, hotels.com. When I'm in the US, I don't use a lot of that, those websites, those .com websites, but for some reason outside of the US, they seem to have more options and work a lot better. Um, a mid-range kind of easy hotel group in Europe is Novotel. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's outside of Europe as well. It's in, the, in Asia as well. Um, so we really like to find local stays if we can, apartments, you know, Airbnbs, Agoda is great as well. Um, and I just compare them all. I look at where I want to stay. It's most important to look at what kind of trans- transport you're going to have. You know, if you're staying in a big city and there's a subway system or buses or trains or taxis that are easily available. Um, that's an easier place to find a stay than if you're rural and you need to consider where am I going to stay and do I need to rent some sort of car or transport. So I look at all of the options with accommodation and transport together and I compare what's going to be the most reasonable, you know, reasonably priced combination. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you a group of questions around something I am so not good at. (laughs) I hope I'm good at it. <laughs> it's on your list. And I'm like, I okay. have failed every single time. <laughs> and I have to bring up a picture and I'll show you. Um, okay. What do you recommend and suggest about packing? Oh, this is my favorite. Okay. And luggage. This, okay, is coming, this, is, this is, yeah, this is coming from someone. And if you go through our packing tips on my uh, World Adventures travel blog website, you'll see that I have always been an overpacker. I like to have options. I like my big suitcases and it's, it's a problem. Packing is a problem for me. <laughs> but what I have kind of honed down my needs and tried really hard to do is um, not take rolling suitcases because you're gonna find yourself in small places with bumpy roads and cobblestone streets and pulling your suitcase up some sort of mountain somewhere in Bali. And um, you just, right. I, I, don't like the, I don't like to have to pull my suitcase and then both of my kids' suitcases because they're too heavy and stuffed full of things. So the life-changing packing tip that I have uh, come down to are dry toiletries, dry toiletries. Nothing liquid, nothing heavy. And this includes everything, body lotion, shampoo and conditioner, bug spray, sunscreen. Uh, every toiletry you can literally imagine, you can get a dry version. And I've tried many, many, many of them. Um, And I will only take ones that I love and that work for me. So even down to like makeup brush cleaner, there is even a dry option for that. And it's incredible. Um, I have a very detailed post on this on the website because I only listed the ones that I actually like. Um, I have me and my daughters, we have thick frizzy hair. We've got dry skin. We (laughs) like to take, you know, like we, we have all the things that you need all your creams and potions for. But 99% of the time, you can find a dry option that works. And then we take small bits of medication that, that we might need to, you know, in a liquid or cream form. So everything is dry or very small. For a long time, my daughters would not swallow pills. So whenever they needed like a children's Motrin or something like that, we had to unfortunately take the liquid version. But do everything you can dry. That'll help with your packing, number one. That's huge. That's huge. Yeah, I just found this picture that just came up in my timeline. I'm going to show it to you. This is me and my massive suitcase. (laughs) And I am somewhere, this is like three years ago. And Mm -hmm. I've been on the road for, well, I've been, I've been settled here in Mexico for, since the pandemic started now, but I had been completely nomadic up until 
you know, 2020 and traveling with that massive suitcase. Gosh, you're amazing. You're amazing. (laughs) Because by the time I left, like, you know, when I was in college and in my twenties and I was traveling and I had all these suitcases and the big, and I was, you know, schlepping this big suitcase through um, through London Heathrow airport where they have those little metal poles at the end of the escalators. (laughs) And it wouldn't fit through the pole. So I had to have, you know, my girlfriends help me lift it up and over the pole. Oh and that God. was the point where I was like, what am I doing? Like this is, and I couldn't get on the train and it was too heavy for me and compound that with kids and it's a nightmare. So, yeah. so now we use travel packs. And when I first got into the travel pack um, situation, I was a little overwhelmed. I thought to myself, you know, we have all the stuff we need, especially for the kids. How do we fit all of this in? What travel packs do I use? What's going to be too heavy for the kids to carry? Because I will not carry my kids stuff anymore. Right. Not anymore. <laughs> They're old enough to carry their own. So um, I stick with some pretty specific guidelines. Um, my husband carries a 65 to 70 liter travel pack. I do 55 to 60. And my kids who are nine and almost 11 do about a 38 to 42 liter at that biggest. And then we also have our, our day backpacks as well. Um, and whatever doesn't fit in there doesn't come. Um, I do have a very detailed packing list on the website as well. It's under one of our guides to planning your family gap year. Um, okay. And I like to take things. Yes, you need to put in. I just, we had a question from Angela for you specifically, actually about yep. your website. She said, can you type out the name of your blog so I can save it for later? I didn't catch it when she said it. The dry products sound awesome. I need a dry yep. bulb spray option. So yep. um, uh, Angela, check back this thread after we're done talking and I'll make sure that Saren goes in and puts in all the specific links for you. So I just want to let you know that there is a question. So please Thank you. carry on, carry on. Yes. So um, I'll say it a little bit slower just in case you have your computer up right now. It's world adventures with an S at the end adventures travel.com. Okay. I'm going to type that in while you're talking world adventures travel.com yep okay um yeah so i am very careful about what i pack i like to use things that are versatile and i'll be really specific in terms of shoes we go to both hot and cold places so i take a flip-flop a water shoe like something that has that's strapped around your foot a walking sneaker for everyday walking and then i have a boot style hiking boot that has to be waterproof that Mm -hmm. Those, those waterproof hiking boots, especially the ones that are made with Gore-Tex, they'll keep you warm enough for some mild winter stuff. They're waterproof um, and you can put a wool sock, you can wear a wool sock with it and it's good for winter. Now, if you're going to be spending six months in, you know, a ski town, for example, we, we go to like a secondhand shop in the places that we go to if it's super cold or super hot and we'll buy a winter boot you know, a a big heavy jacket if we need to. So all of those things that are very weather specific, we like to buy when we get there. Um, We will carry one wool base layer for all of us. So we have our waterproof hiking boot, our our wool base layer. Um, We tend to have some sort of cashmere uh, scarf or wrap with us because you can use it when it's hot out. You can use it when it's cold out. Um, and then all, all the things that you don't want to carry with you that are bulky, we buy when we get there in the secondhand shop. Yeah, perfect. That's what I did too. And I think the part of the reason why I looked at what we were doing differently than a gap year or somebody who has a base somewhere, um, this it was everything I owned. And I was like, I'm allowed to have some yeah. fashionable yes. stuff. So I, and I think that kind of attitude is slightly different, especially if you're slow traveling, if you're going to some place for four months and another place for four months. And I think the attachment to things um, really loosens, you know, I, mm-hmm. even, though, even though I have a big suitcase and I have more now that I've been stationary for two years. Yeah. But even though I had a big suitcase, I felt like, you know, I love these things. I bought them at a secondhand store, but when I'm done with them and I haven't worn them within one month, they go, that's my rule. So yes, yeah. that attachment to things goes out the window pretty quickly. And it's hard with kids. My kids travel with one like special stuffed animal they sleep with. Um, and that's about it. Everything is pictures. You know, when we get home to our home base, we do make like an actual album that we print out 
and they like to look back on, but that stays in our home base. That does not come with us. You can always, they can, you know, pull up my phone or their iPads and they can look at pictures, but something we did a few years ago, which we switched a little bit, but we started doing when we were traveling around the U.S., um, pins on their backpack. Like they would get junior ranger badge pins and pins from places that. that we've been to. Now here's the problem with pins. Uh -oh. They're metal. They're me they're metal, and they're heavy when there's 50 of them on your backpack. They're actually heavy. So we started doing badges instead that you could iron on or sew on. So now instead of pins, they get badges or little patches, um, and that way they remember the places they've been to. But it's not heavy, and it's not a big thing that they keep taking with us everywhere that they're going. Good, good, good. I love yeah. that. That's such a great idea. I can't remember the things that we. I was, my son is in his 20s now, but, you know, from 10 to, you know, all the way through till this age, like there were different stages of things that were important to him. Like we carried around mm -hmm. for the beginning years, a really big bag of Legos. And that was really important. Yeah. And there was a time where he gave that away. And he's like, I'm yep. done with these. And, and that's important. That's important to talk about, too, is how to what games and toys come with you if you have younger kids. You know, mine are still nine and 11 and we play a lot of card games and my little one I call them tchotchkes but all like the little things the little figurines and the little rocks and the yeah. little stones and she loves that stuff so to kind of help her fill that bucket when we're gone um in her day pack in the backpack that we travel with she gets sort of one ziploc size bag let's say of little cars or you know little figurines or because that can keep her busy for hours so it's worth bringing with us yeah. Um, but you kind of have to minimize it to just a certain amount. We play a lot of card games um, yeah, that we take we with us for long travel days. We still. always carry, <laughs> yep, still. And we always carry a, a notebook or a sketchbook, but just one, one per person. And it is not spiral bound because spirals get heavy and they're kind of cumbersome, but it's just a paper, you know, paperback notebook or sketchbook and colored pens. Yeah. Colored pens, colored pencils or colored pens. We don't really carry markers because they take up a lot of space. Yep. But oh, I had the same ones. I love them. <laughs> but color pens are great because it meets that need for any art they want to do or sketching, but they can also write in their journal with the same pen. Exactly. And my son used to love to collect rocks. Rocks are heavy. So rocks we are heavy. <laughs> We decided then I gave him a, like an old Altoids tin. So that mm -hmm. was the extent of the rocks. So he started looking for a lot smaller rocks so we could have more. And it was really like, and he always was proud of this great little collection. And it, you know, and when, when there wasn't enough space, he would rotate things out and put new things in. And that, mm -hmm. that you know, the um, like small space really helped. And in fact, yeah, we're I love that. We're talking about kids, so why don't you jump into part of your expertise of preparing kids for travel? I know we touched on that in the beginning, but maybe you can expand on some of those ideas as well. Uh-oh. Cutting out just a little bit. Let me see if I can hear you. Are oh. you there? Yeah, I'm here. You're frozen for me. Am I frozen? Let me take a look here. Perfect. Let me know if it's not coming through and I'll restart my internet. But from what I heard from you, you want to hear about preparing kids for traveling. Yes, um, please. Most, m mostly emotionally. Um, so again, I have this great guide that I actually just finished a couple weeks ago because I was doing all this stuff with my kids and I thought, and I was listening to podcasts and I was, you know, reading online and I was talking to other families and I thought, you know, what's the best way to make sure that we've talked about everything and that my kids' feelings have been validated. And my number one uh, you know, requests maybe from all parents who are doing this is validate your kids' feelings and be very mindful about what, how you respond to them rather than saying, don't, you know, don't be sad. Don't be worried. We're going to get to do all these fun things. Kind of change that narrative and the way you communicate a little bit. And you can say things like, um, I see you're really sad about leaving. You know, let's talk about that. I feel a little bit sad about this too. Or I see you're worried about this. That's normal. I feel worried too. Let's talk more about it. And that right. way they're being allowed to have their feelings and you're not telling them it's, you know, not to be sad or not to be worried, but then you help them talk about it. And as we all know, sometimes when you just talk about something, it's less scary or less upsetting. Um, and there doesn't have to be a solution at the end. It just allows them to talk about it. So we yeah. do that. But most importantly, before you leave for your, your home base, 
I always ask my kids, what's something that you want to do one more time before we leave that you love doing here? And we make sure that we do everybody's thing. So if one person wants to go to this park or one person wants to go to that favorite trampoline place or one person wants to go on a hike that they love, we make sure that everybody gets their one or two things that they want to do before we take off. And we usually do that one to two months before if we have the time, like if we have that amount of time before we leave. Um, and also we talk about who are the people you want to say goodbye to and who are the people you want to say goodbye to one-on-one, -on -one, which is very, a little bit different. So we like to plan, and not all families you know, feel the need to do this, but we like to plan one sort of goodbye bash, like a barbecue or a get together or a potluck or whatever your family's comfortable with where we see our extended family and all the cousins and all of the friends and acquaintances. Um, and it doesn't have to be expensive. It can just be kind of a get together where you get to see everyone. But then we like to make time for those one-on-one. -on -one. So if there's a special friend or two that my kids are really going to miss, we set up a play date just with those friends. And we spend a whole, you know, a half day or a whole day just hanging out with them. Um, and then at the end, we talk about how do you want to stay in touch with that person? Yep. <laughs> because I think that's really kids, my kids, I don't know about other kids, but my kids are not internet connected. They don't have phones. They do have tablets and iPads, but they're not, you know, communicating with strangers and the, and the internet. So it's really um, controlled still. And we want to make sure that they have a plan of how they're going to keep in touch with those friends and family members. So do they want to FaceTime once a week? Do they want to write letters and postcards? Do they want to call them on the phone and make sure that they're available during the times that we call? So we make a plan and it makes them feel better because they don't feel like they're just leaving and they're never going to communicate with their best friends or with their grandparents. I mean, you know, we're very close to my parents and my husband's parents. And I think it's really important to have a plan that the kids help to make. So it's not you telling them this is how we're doing it. It's how, is, how do you want to do it? What works for you and makes you feel like you've been, you know, you've been heard and your, your feelings are, your, your needs are met. Right. Super important. I love all of these tips. Um, one of the things that my son and I did when we first started out was we defined the language of what it feels like to be inside of our comfort zone. And then when we're not in the comfort zone, we got more specific and we call that the stretch zone. And that's a space where mm -hmm. we're uncomfortable. Um, we're growing, we're learning, but it it's not always easy. And then we got really familiar with the space outside of the stretch zone, which we call the panic zone. So now that we've got this sort of diagram of these things and we've defined all of the experiences that we've had on reflection, where we are in, you know, during the specific experiences, we had the language to talk about it and we normalized it. So, you know, mom, I'm in yep. my panic zone now. Okay, then let's, let's re-regulate and, and take the time that we need for that. Or, you know, that really sucked. I was really in my stretch zone, almost on the edge, you know, and of course we drew the picture, right, of the circle yep. inside the circle, inside of the circle. And that really helped us to process our daily experiences as they came up. And that actually leads mm -hmm. me into the next point that you brought up on your very prepared and organized bullet point <laughs> list, which was family <laughs> meetings. And it was something yeah. that my son and I absolutely engaged in and we were committed to. Why don't you talk about what that looks like in your family? Absolutely. And I just want to go back and say, I love the way that you diagrammed that out in terms of your comfort zone, your stretch zone, and your panic zone. Yeah, I love, and especially as a pediatric speech therapist who works with occupational therapists every day, I love that. And I have a child who um, has this, you know, yes, I love that. It kind of looks like it's coming right out of my occupational therapy, you know, uh, the things I refer back to when I'm referring families out. But my, I have a daughter who is sensory sensitive, you know, loud noises. She's an introvert. I'm an introvert. Um, I think traveling as an introvert is a very interesting experience. And I also wrote about that on the blog because it's just so different the way that my husband and my youngest daughter function, the way that myself and my oldest daughter function is just very different. And the needs are different. And sometimes you can get overwhelmed you know, with, with your sensory system and you just need to be able to label those feelings and, and to know what to do when you're in those zones. Um, I'd love to maybe at another time talk more about traveling with kids of special needs because 
Let's you can do it. do it. You can do it. And I think you need that support if you've already been seeing a speech therapist or an occupational therapist or a mental health professional. And if your kids have, that's someone you might want to stay in contact with on a regular basis when you're traveling. If your child has a relationship with a therapist of any kind that helps them to regulate their emotions and regulate their sensory system, it's imp really important to stay in touch with that person and on a regular basis. And your child can kind of decompress by talking to that person about yeah. what happened when. And it gives you the language, if you can see those sessions happening, it gives you the language to talk to your child in the moment about what's happening. Um, and you're right, I have a, I had this magnet that's been in our home-based refrigerator for years and I got it in New York City and it says life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Yeah. <laughs> and I love it. I've never let go of that magnet, like speaking of things that you won't let go of, um, <laughs> because it reminds me as a serious introvert, it reminds me that it's okay to be outside of your comfort zone, but it's more important to know where your zone is and then to challenge yourself to push through that just a little bit. Um, and I like to the boundaries change, which is why I feel it's really important for families to do the exercise of defining what makes their comfort zone and what are the things that they put in there. So when somebody is feeling dysregulated, you can say, well, hey, you know, Jim, I know that you like to, to put on your headphones and listen to music. So that really, that might be a great yeah. idea for you right now or whatever the thing is, right? Yes, strategies are important, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, And it does change and it'll depend on how they're feeling that day. It'll depend on how much you've done that morning already. It'll depend on a lot of factors. And if you know your kids, and I think the community that we're talking to really knows our kids, we spend a lot of time with our kids. And- um, Or you're about you know, to. <laughs> or, you're, or you're about to, right. And it's really important that you know what their triggers are. And yeah. it doesn't have to be something related to a, any sort of sensory disorder that they may or may not have, but even any person has their limits. And we're getting really outside of our limits and comfort zones on these kind of, you know, trips and, and family changes. So yes, I love that you have the, the chart and you can kind of identify the different zones for your kids and for yourself too. Um, in one of my blog posts about being an introvert and traveling, I kind of put a sample of what our day looks like that helps to meet the needs of all the kinds of personalities in our family. Um, because there are some personalities in our family who are go, 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 and they need, they need the energy, they need to be around people to feel good, that's their comfort zone. And then there's the introverts in our family who need that quiet time every day, almost. Or if we have a really busy day one day, I know the next day that we need some downtime. So it's important to, you know, you don't want to get into another country and a foreign country and an experience that's new for you and feel like every day is a meltdown. You want to make sure that you let your life ebb and flow and make sure that everybody's getting their sensory needs met or their downtime or their quiet time um, to help that go well. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you articulated that so beautifully because it's really important for people to hear that, right? I am an extrovert, surprise, surprise, but my son is an introvert and I had to really learn how to manage our ebbs and flows based on both of us getting our needs met. And we, we talk a lot about something that I call partnership parenting, which is you know akin to radical unschooling and, and that sort mm -hmm. of approach which is not for everybody, but it's it's taking out the authoritarian approach to parenting and really navigating the world, like literally, <laughs> um, through partnership, right? We, yeah. Every person has different responsibilities and different skill sets and different abilities, um, but nobody has authority over one another and everybody's right. needs are important. So absolutely, I love that. Yeah, nice, nice. So sometimes with with introverts, you need to have a couple of down days. And that's where I find the flexibility in scheduling so important. Can you talk a little bit about um, maybe how you discuss budgets and planning and activities with younger kids and how sure. you manage as a family? Absolutely. So as the researcher in the family, and it's, I think it's because I have a control issue where I just like to be in control of everything. But as a researcher in the family, I do a lot of research first. And I kind of bring that to the family into our family meetings. Here's some things I found. Here's some places that, that we can go and things we can do in this next place that we're going to. 
what's interesting to you? What do you really want to do? What might be scary, but that you might want to try? So I bring a lot of information because my kids are really too young to do in-depth research right now. They can kind of, you know, look online and get some ideas, but it's hard for them to plan out the logistics of a day or of a month for our, for our travels. So I bring them the information and we talk about what looks fun, what looks exciting, what might be a little scary, but we want to get out of our comfort zone. What are we, and that's okay to not be interested in something. Like there's some things that we are not interested in doing. There are some places this morning, I was doing some detailed planning for um, Indonesia and for next year. And there's this, you know, monkey forest and, a lot yeah. of people are say are saying that the, mon the monkeys are pretty intense and they'll bite you and they'll you know and you know what the truth is I don't need to do that you know there's so many things I love to do but monkeys pulling on me and biting me and it, just, it, doesn't, it doesn't it doesn't speak it doesn't speak to me it just doesn't right. so and that's okay it's okay not to be adventurous all the time you know there are things that I want to do that maybe I'm scared to do and then I want to try. And then there's things where I'm like, you know what? I'm not ready for it. And that's okay for your kids too. So I bring all my, my planning to the family meeting, give some ideas, and then see what each person, what kind of lights up each person. You know, I have, um, my family loves the water. We love oceans and we love swimming and we love snorkeling and we love anything related to water. My husband could just float in the ocean for 12 hours a day and he'd be in this happy place so we love we love we love water and especially blue water you know water where you can see what's underneath you so anything that has to do with that I know is going to bring my family joy and it's going to be an exciting experience for them so you kind of again have to know your family but also bring them some interesting ideas and see what happens at the meeting and then in terms of budget you have to really think about what's most important and what is going to fill everybody's bucket I like to look for the free and cheap things first to do in every place we go to, you know, the, the nature walks, the hiking trails, we love to hike um, the national parks, if you're in certain parts of the world that have national parks. Um, we like to just kind of wander cities and explore and see what happens sometimes. And, some, and I try to stay away from the touristy areas because obviously the food and accommodations are going to be much more expensive. Yeah. Um, but it just takes research on my part and then bringing it to the family. And we do have a budget. We stick to a budget. We, um, you know, we save up specifically for travel related things that are outside of our regular expenses that we need to take care of. You know, you're still, even if, whether you have a house and you're just doing a gap year or whether you don't have a house, there's still things like insurances and, you know, medical expenses and things that you're going to need to budget for, which don't necessarily change from place to place. So it's those changing parts of the budget in terms of accommodation and flights that we keep tabs, close tabs on. And this is a great world schooling, educational kind of thing, because my kids are involved in budgeting, keeping track of our expenses, um, adding things up, you know, leaving tip and figuring out how much tip to leave. Um, all of those things that, and this is a whole other conversation about how to educate your kids while on the road, but this is a really good way, the budget piece of it is a good way for your kids to see and learn about money and saving and budgeting and not necessarily always getting what you want because it might be out of budget for the family or finding ways to get what you want in a different way. So Absolutely. I would say, yeah, and I would say, you know, every person's budget is going to be different and you can see on a lot of travel blogs online what people's family budgets are, but I think it's more about how how comfortable do you want to be or how uncomfortable are you willing to get, right? So our challenge in the next year or two for our family is let's get uncomfortable and be okay with it. You know, maybe it's not the nicest place that we stay in, or maybe we're in a place where we have to walk longer distances than we like to, to get to the main part of town, or, you know, maybe it's navigating a, a new train or, or subway system rather than hiring a car. Or so I think you have to talk to the family during your meeting about what your travel could look like. You know, sometimes when we look at accommodations with the kids, I show them pictures of what I can find online about those, the inside of these accommodations look like, which can help with their worries and their anxieties, but it also helps them to plan, okay, I'm going to sleep here and my sister's going to sleep here. So I feel more comfortable now that I can see it. Um, so I would take advantage of those kind of things, things that we can access online to make your kids feel ready to be a little bit uncomfortable. 
Yeah, yeah. And I would always say that our world schooling journey helped us develop the the muscle to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And yeah. those people who haven't had that experience, if I travel with them or meet up with them somewhere, you can tell. You can yeah. tell. You can tell you if can they tell. don't have that experience. Yeah. And it is a, and it is a muscle. You have to you've got to get uncomfortable to get used to being uncomfortable. Um, it's definitely a muscle. And I would say, I don't know what your experience was, you know, when you were younger and kind of living out of the house for the first time. But when I went to college and lived out of the house for the first time, it took me three months to not be homesick. Yeah, and no, I had, and I had, <laughs> that wasn't my I, problem. <laughs> and and I, I had traveled a lot. I was comfortable traveling and being away from home, but I was homesick for my, just my routine and my comfort. So I would give your kids at least three months before things start feeling a little more comfortable. Those first three months if you're, when you're away are really tough. They're tough for everybody being together, you know, going through challenges, solving problems, being uncomfortable, um, not knowing where to go or the language or what to do or how to find a, a resource. Those three months are hard. So don't base your experience on the first three months. Give yourselves time and give your kids time to get into the, the to, to flex those muscles of flexibility. Absolutely, yeah. And I would say the biggest changes, thinking back to the beginning of my travels and wow, to the like, like, what, 13, 14 years ago now, I remember those first nights and the like, yeah. the crying, like, what did I do? Oh my <laughs> God, you know, like that kind of like, wow, everything is so different. And then the actual, like, pulling apart and processing the fears as they came up, but having the language to talk about those things and having a safe space where this was part of normalizing what our partnership was becoming, was to become in order for us to travel. I yeah. think those things are really important. And that's an incredible piece of advice for for people that are just starting to plan, don't base your world schooling journey on the first three months. Those yes. are some of the hardest months. I totally agree. But I could exactly. tell you, you know, 14, I think it's 14 years later. It's amazing. Know? That's so amazing. I can't wait to be there. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And I, I love the young person that my son, young adult that my son has become because of all of these experiences. Well, I think you did an amazing job getting people, you know, sort of geared up to plan and pre prepare. And thank you for sharing your expertise. I do invite you to go into the comments and put your links, anything that you think, you know, is relevant or any of the, the um, links of the articles that you talked about in this interview and um, we should talk again about uh neurodivergent traveling with with um neurodivergent children and and i would love that back back. that'd yes. be wonderful thank you for having me i'm so excited when we close off here i'll go into the comment section and i'll put some links for everybody um, and if they have questions, they can contact me or, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I do love talking about it and writing about it. And I have some major mistakes that people can learn from. So, yeah. And if you're watching this in replay, do put in hashtag replay. And if you can, uh, tag Sa uh, Saren, and I'm going to tag her in this post as well. So you can see her name. Um, all right, then thank you. We're out. And thank give you. Me a second. I'm going to stop recording. Oh, I didn't even record. Huh. Oh, no. I should have no, recorded it. No, it's recorded. It. <laughs> it's, it's in okay. the...